Okay, this is part two of chapter 13. And last thing I read is that there was an animal coming out of the darkness, moving kind of slowly and kind of in a creepy way. <clears throat> As the animal came closer, Rainy said, Why, it's old Blue. How did he get loose? It was a big blue tick hound. Around his neck was a piece of rope about three feet long. One could see that the rope had been gnawed in two. The frayed end had become entangled in a fair-sized dead limb. Dragging the limb was what made the dog look so odd. I felt much better when I found out what it was. The blue tick hound was like the, was like the Pritchards, mean and ugly. He was a big dog, tall and heavy. His chest was thick and solid. He came up growling. The hair on his back was standing straight up. He walked stiff-legged around old Dan, showing his teeth. I told Rainy he better get hold of his dog or there was sure to be a fight. You better get a hold of your dog, he said. I'm not worried about old Blue. He can take care of him. I said no more. Don't make no difference now whether you kill the ghost coon or not, Reuben said. Old Blue will take care of him. I knew the killing of the coon was out of my control, but I didn't want to see him die. I said to Reuben, just give back my two dollars and I'll go home. I can't keep you from killing him, but I don't have to stay and see it. Reuben, don't give him the money, Rainy said. He ain't killed the ghost coon. That's right, Reuben said. You ain't, and I wouldn't let you now eat him if you wanted to. I told them my dogs had treed the ghost coon, and that is what the bet was, to tree the ghost coon. No, it wasn't, Reuben said. You said you would kill him. It was no such thing, I said. I've done all I said I would. Reuben walked up in front of me. He said, I ain't going to give you that money. You didn't win it fair. Now what are you going to do about it? I looked into his mean eyes. I started to make some reply, but decided against it. He saw my hesitation and said, you better get your dogs and get out of here before you get whipped. In loud voice, Rainy said, bloody his nose, Reuben. I was scared. I couldn't whip Reuben. He was too big for me. I started to turn and leave when I thought of what my grandfather had told them. You had better remember what my grandpa said, I reminded them. He'll do just what he said he would. If you don't remember, his grandpa said, if you hurt my grand grandson, that he would like find a way to get them to go to jail in a different county. <clears throat> Reuben didn't hit me. He just grabbed me and with his brute strength threw me down on the ground. He had me on my back with my arms outspread. He had a knee on each arm. I made no effort to fight back. I was scared. If you say one word to your grandpa about this, Reuben said, I'll catch you hunting some night and I will beat you. Looking up into his ugly face, I knew he would do just what he said. I told him to let me up and I would go and not say anything to anyone. Don't let him up, Reuben, Rainy said. Beat him. Or hold him and I'll do it. Just then I heard growling and a commotion off to one side. The blue hound had finally gotten a fight out of old Dan. Turning my head sideways, I could see them standing on their hind legs, tearing and slashing at each other. The weight of the big hound pushed old Dan over. I told Reuben to let me up so we could stop the fight. He laughed. While my dog is whipping yours, I think I'll just work you over a little. So saying, he jerked my cap off and started whipping me in the face with it. I heard Rainy yell, Reuben, they're killing old Blue. Reuben jumped up off me. I clambered up and looked over to the fight. What I saw thrilled me. Faithful little Anne, girl though she was, had gone to the assistance of old Dan. I knew my dogs were very close to each other. Everything they did was done as a combination, but I never expected this. It is a rare occasion for a girl dog to fight another dog, but fight she did. I could see that little Anne's jaws were glued to the throat of the big hound. She would never loosen the deadly hold until the last breath of life was gone. Old Dan was tearing and slashing at the soft belly. I knew the destruction his long, sharp teeth were causing. Again, Rainy yelled, Reuben, they're killing him. They're killing old Blue. Do something quick. Reuben darted over to one side, grabbed my axe from the ground, and said in a loud voice, I'll kill them hounds. At the thought of what he was going to do with the axe, I screamed and ran for my dogs. 
Reuben was about ten feet ahead of me, bent over, running with the axe held out in front of him. I knew I could never get to them in time. I was screaming, no, Reuben, no! I saw the small stick when it whipped up from the ground. As if it were alive, it caught between Reuben's legs. I saw him fall. I ran on by. Reaching the dogfight, I saw the big hound was almost gone. He had long since ceased fighting. His body lay stretched full length on the ground. I grabbed old Dan's collar and pulled him back. It was different with little Anne. Pull as I might, she wouldn't let go of the hound's throat. Her jaws were locked. I turned old Dan loose and getting a straddle of little Anne, I pried her jaws apart with my hands. Old Dan had darted back in, grabbing his collar again, and I pulled them off to one side. The blue hound lay where he was. I thought perhaps he was already dead, and then I saw him move a little. Still holding my dogs by their collars, I looked back. I couldn't understand what I saw. Reuben was laying where he had fallen. His back was toward me, and his body was bent in a U-shape. Rainy was standing on the other side of him, staring down. I hollered and asked Rainy, "'What's the matter?' He didn't answer. He just stood as though in a trance, staring down at Reuben. I hollered again. He still didn't answer. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn my dogs loose. They would go for the hound again. Again, I hollered at Rainy, asking him to come and help me. He ne neither moved nor answered. I had to do something. Looking around, my glance fell on the old barbed wire fence. I led my dogs to it. Holding on to their collars with one hand, I worked a rusty barbed wire backwards and forwards against a staple until it broke. Running the end of it under their collars, I tied them up. They made two or three lunges toward the hound, but the wire held. I walked over and stopped at Rainey's side. I again asked, what's the matter? He said, not a word. I could see that Rainey was paralyzed with fright. His mouth and eyes were open wide. His face was as white as chalk. I laid my hand on his shoulder. At the touch of my hand, he jumped and screamed. Still screaming, he turned and started running. I watched him until he disappeared into the darkness. Looking down at Reuben, I saw what had paralyzed Rainey. When Reuben had tripped, he had fallen on the ass. As it entered his stomach, the sharp blade had sunk to the eye of the double-bitted axe. Turning my back to the horrible sight, I closed my eyes. The muscles in my stomach knotted and jerked. A nauseating sickness spread over my body. I couldn't look at him. I heard Reuben whisper. Turning around, I knelt down by his side with the back to the axe. I couldn't understand what he was whispering. Kneeling down closer, I heard and understood. In a faint voice, he said, take it out. I hesitated. Again, he pleaded, please take it out. Turning around, I saw his hands were curled around the protruding blade as if he himself had tried to pull it out. How I did it, I'll never know. Putting my hands over his and pressing down, I pulled the axe from the wound. The blood gushed. I felt the warm heat as it spread over my hands. Again, the sickness came over me. I stumbled to my feet and stepped back a few paces. Seeing a movement from Reuben, I thought he was going to get up. With his hands, he pushed himself halfway up. His eyes were wide open, staring straight at me. Stopping in his effort of getting up, still staring at me, his mouth was opened as if he were going to say something. But words never came out. He fell back to the ground, and I knew he was dead. Scared, not knowing what to do, I called for Rainy. I got no answer. I called his name again and again, and I could get no reply. My voice echoed in the darkness of the silent night. A cold chill ran over my body. I suppose it is natural at a time like that for a boy to think of his mother. I thought of mine. I wanted to go home. Going over to my dogs, I glanced to where the blue hound was. He was trying to get up. I was glad that he wasn't dead. Picking up my lantern, I thought of my axe. I left it. I didn't care if I ever saw it again. Knowing I couldn't turn my dogs loose, I broke off en enough of the wire to leave them. As I passed under the branches of the bur oak tree, I looked up into the dark foliage. I could see the bright eyes of the ghost coon. Everything that had happened on this terrible night was because of his very existence. But it wasn't his fault. I also knew he was a silent witness to the horrible scene. 
Behind me lay the still body of a young boy. On my left, a blue tick hound lay torn and bleeding. Even after all that had happened, I could feel no hatred for the ghost and was not sorry I had let him live. Arriving home, I awakened my mother and father. Starting at my grandfather's mill, I told everything that had happened. I left nothing out. If you, want, if you don't remember, remember Billy didn't tell them about the bet. He, his grandfather was the only one that knew. Sorry, train. I told everything that had happened. I left nothing out. My mother had started crying long before I had completed my story. Papa said nothing, just sat and listened. When I had finished, she kept staring down at the floor in deep thought. I could hear the sobbing of my mother in the silence. I walked over her. She put her arms around me and said, my poor little boy. Getting to his feet, Papa reached for his coat and hat. Mama asked him where he was going. Well, I'll have to go up there, he said. I'm going to get Grandpa, for he's the only man in the country that has authority to move the body. Looking at me, he said, you go across the river and get old man Lowry. And you may as well go on up and tell the Bufords, too. Tell them to meet us at your grandfather's place. I hurried to carry the sad message. The following day was a nasty one. A slow, cold drizzle had set in. Feeling trapped indoors, I prowled from room to room. I couldn't understand why my father hadn't come back from the Pritchards. I sat by the window and watched the road. Understanding my feelings, Mama said, Billy, I wouldn't worry. He'll be back before long. It takes time for things like this. I know, I said, but you would think he would have been back by now. Time dragged slowly by. Late in the afternoon, I saw Papa coming. Our old mule was jogging along. Water was shooting out from under his feet in small squirts at every step. Papa had tied the halter rope around the mule's neck. He was sitting humped over with his hands jammed deep in the, po uh, the pockets of his patched and worn Mackinac. I felt sorry for him. He was soaking wet, tired, sleepy, and hungry. Telling Mama, here he is, I grabbed my jumper and cap and ran out to the gate and waited. I was going to ask him what had happened at the Pritchards, but on seeing his tired face and wet clothes, I said, Papa, you better go into the fire. I'll take care of the mule and do the feeding and milking. That would be fine, he said. After doing the chores, I hurried to the house. I couldn't wait any longer. I had to find out what had happened. Walking into the front room, I saw my father had changed clothes. He was standing in front of the fire, fireplace, drinking coffee. Boy, that's bad weather, isn't it? He said. I said it was, and then I asked him about Reuben. He went to the old tree and got Reuben's body, Papa said. We were on our way back to the Pritchards when we met them. They were just a sigh of their place. They had started to look for him. Rainy had been so dazed when he got home, they couldn't make out what he was trying to tell them, but they knew it must have been something bad. They wanted to know what had happened. I did my best to explain the accident. It hit old man Pritchard pretty hard. I felt sorry for him. Mama asked how Mrs. Pritchard was taking it. Papa said he didn't know, as he never did get to see any of the woman folks. He said they were the funniest bunch he had ever seen. He couldn't understand them. There wasn't one tear shed that he could see. All of the men stayed out at the barn. They never had been invited in for a cup of coffee or anything. Mama asked when they were to have the funeral. They have their own gra graveyard right there on the place, Papa said. Old man Pritchard said they would take care of everything and didn't want to bother people. He said it was too far for anyone to come and it was bad weather too. Mama said she couldn't help feeling sorry for Mrs. Pritchard and wished they were more friendly. I asked Papa about Rainy. Papa said, well, according to what old man Pritchard said, Rainy just couldn't seem to get over the shock. They were figuring on taking him into town to see the doctor. In a stern voice, Papa said, Billy, I don't want you fooling around with those Pritchards anymore. You have plenty of country around here, so you don't have to go there and hunt. I said I wouldn't. I felt bad about the death of Reuben. I didn't feel like hunting and kept having bad dreams. I couldn't forget the way he had looked at me just before he had died. I moped and wandered around in a daze. I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what it was. I explained my feelings to my mother. She said, Billy, I feel the same way, and I would like to do something to help, but I guess there's nothing we can do. There are people like the Pritchards all through the hills. They live in little worlds of their own and are all alone. They don't like to have outsiders interfere. 
I told my mother I'd been thinking about how dangerous it was to carry an axe while hunting, and I had decided I'd save a few coon hides and get a good gun. Boy, I just shouldn't have mentioned getting a gun. My mother got sitting hen mad. You are not getting a gun, she said. I won't have that at all. I told you a long time ago you could have one when you were 21 years old, and I mean just that. I worry enough with you out there in the hills all hours of the night, running and jumping, but I couldn't stand it if I knew you had a gun with you. No, sir, you could just forget about a gun. Yes, Mama, I said, and socked off to my room. Lying on my bed, still trying to figure out what I could do to help, I glanced over to the wall. The air tied in a small bundle was just what I needed. Some time back, my sisters had made some flowers for decoration day. They had given me a small bouquet for my room. Taking them down, I could see they had faded a little and looked rather old, but they were still pretty. I blew the dust off and straightened the crinkled petals, putting them inside my shirt. I left the house. And um, just a fun fact here, Memorial Day was actually used to be called Decoration Day. And that was the day where people would go and put flowers on um, the graves of the people that they had in their family or who they, who they remembered and, and loved. So it used to be called Decoration Day. I hadn't gone far when I heard something behind me. It was my dogs. I tried to tell them I wasn't going hunting. I just had a little business to attend to. And if they would go back, I'd take them out that night. It was no use. They couldn't understand. Circling around through the flats, I came to the hollow above the Pritchard's place. Down below me, I could see the graveyard and the fresh mound of dirt. As quietly as I could, I started easing myself down the mountainside. Old Dan loosened a rock. The further it bounced, the louder it got. It slammed up against a post oak tree and sounded like a gunshot. I held my breath and watched the house. No one came out. I glared at old Dan. He wagged his tail, and just to show off, he sat down on his rear and started digging at a flea with his hind leg. The way his leg was thumping in the leaves, anyone could have heard it from a mile. I waited until he quit thumping before starting on. Reaching the bottom, I had about 20 yards of clearing to cross, but the grass and bushes were pretty thick. Laying down on my stomach with my heart beating like a trip hammer, I wiggled my way to Reuben's grave. I laid the flowers on the fresh mound of earth and then turned around and scooted for the timber. Just as we reached the mountaintop, my foot slipped and I kicked loose a rock, large rock. Down the side of the mountain it rolled. This time the blue tick hound heard the noise. He came out from under the house bawling. I heard a door slam and Mrs. Pritchard came out. She stood looking this way and that way. The hound ran up to the graveyard and started sniffing and bawling. Mrs. Pritchard followed him. Seeing the flowers on Reuben's grave, she picked them up and looked at them. She scolded the hound and then looked up at the hillside. I knew she couldn't see me because the timber was too thick, but I felt uncomfortable anyway. Scolding the hound again, she knelt down and arranged the flowers on the grave. Taking one more look at the hillside, she started back. Halfway to the house, I saw her reach down and gather the long cotton skirt in her hand and dab at her eyes. I felt much better after paying my respects to Reuben. Everything looked brighter, and I didn't have that funny feeling anymore. All the way home, my dogs kept running out in front of me. They would stop, turn around, and look at me. I had to smile, for I knew what they wanted. I stopped and petted them a little and told them that as soon as I got home and had my supper, we would go hunting. So that's a pretty tough chapter to read. A lot of things happen. And um, yeah, if you have any thoughts about this chapter, feel free to post your thoughts um, on this video. Um, and yeah, I'd love to talk about it with you.